Hey, everybody. My name is Nala Simone Chisan. Pronoun she, her, goddess works perfectly fine. In other places, I'm also called Ia, uh, which means mother. I, I come to you by ways of New Jersey, New York area, uh, which is uh, Lenape land. Uh, I am the founder and president of Reuniting of African Descendants, Road Inc. I am the mother. I am a mother to a lot of motherless folks. Uh, I'm a freedom fighter uh, for my trans and non-binary siblings across the African diaspora. I'm a healer, an educator, a spiritual practitioner who focuses on inclusivity of folks who are often excluded. Uh, my name is Ren. My pronouns are she, her. I'm Palestinian. Uh, I'm queer. And I work for Adela Justice Project, which is an organization, a Palestinian-led organization uh, based here in the United States that focuses on uh, a lot of different things. Um, you know, we're a 501c3, but we do a lot of work in terms of educating people, political education around Palestine, uh, encouraging folks to uh, raise more awareness, learn more about Palestine, and teaching folks in this country how to get engaged, how to uncover the complicities that we're involved in here with all the heavy funding that's going into uh, Israel, specifically for military, but of course for other things, and how we can teach folks here to divest, how to boycott, all those things that go into essentially how we can play our part in the Palestinian liberation. <laughs> Mi yasaha na hisapa ochati shakoi hacha le mi eta na mini luzaha. I would like to greet each and every one of you with a handshake from my heart. My my colonizer name is Candy Brings Plenty. <clears throat> my Lakota name is Bright Lightning Woman and Woman Close to My Heart. And also <clears throat> I'm greeting each and every one of you from the Sacred Black Hills in Ocheti Shakoi territory. I am an enrolled member of the Oglala Sioux tribe, and I come from the Pine Ridge Reservation. And you can Google POW, Prisoner of War Camp, number 334, and you will see the lands that I come from. Um, all Indian reservations are still active prisoner of war camps. That's why they're called reservations. It's land that was reserved to prison, imprison the uh, indigenous people of the land during the land grab, during the times of when our land was stolen and, you know, continuous colonial violence had spread amongst beyond any type of um, viral uh, biochemical warfare. So, you know, I, I like to just really open direct with my Lakota protocol and also, you know, introducing myself in my traditional language because we have been born in, you know, in colonial terms organized because we come from the land. We introduce ourselves based on our dialect, our language, and it, it refers to where we're birthed from, which is why Unchi Maka, Mother Earth, is, is our mother. Um, I am a water protector, a land defender. Um, I am a protector of the sacred, and I am a non-binary Two-Spirit. I also was the lead of the Two-Spirit Nation camp at Standing Rock, which, you know, lit a fire, and now there's so much um, Two-Spirit and trans folks and leadership in the environmental acts and all of the front lines that are going on across Unchi Maka. So hi everyone. Uh, I'm gonna say check it. She her pronouns. Um I'm currently uh I work with Utopia Washington. We're based uh here in Kent um on the lands of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Makushut and the Duwamish and Puyallup nations. And um as we continue to stand in solidarity and by recognizing First Nation people, both past and present. Uh, so I work for Utopia Washington uh, as our systems policy and environmental and culture change program coordinator. 
uh, that is spearheading our climate and environmental justice program. Utopia Washington, um, it's a queer and trans Pacific Islander led organization founded in 2009 through the lived experiences of queer and trans Pacific Islanders. Our work really prioritizes the care, safety, and the cultural narratives of our communities through several of the programs, which include our Mapo My Clinic, which is offering free primary and gender affirming care, regardless of insurance status. And through our Speak Change, we are influencing systems and policy engagement. And through our MANA uh, program, we ensure that we celebrate our current cultural heritage uh, as Pacifica or Pacific Islanders, empowering our community to be visible and to be resilient. And this work, through this work, we, we hope to achieve the world of abundance, autonomy, and also harmony where we, where all forms of supremacy cease to exist for all lives. I identify as two spirits, and yes, it is a contemporary colonial term, it is an umbrella term that was coined in the early 1990s by our, which we call our two-spirit elders. There's the ones who were actually creating a narrative. And that's why I often like to talk about, we're doing this work for those who are yet to come. You know, those, there's over 580 federally recognized tribes. And that's the important part I want to highlight right now because it's the government who has chosen which tribes to recognize. And those are the tribes that were complicit and who assimilated accordingly, because that's exactly what had happened. Um, Two-spirit people, you know, and I'm gonna continue using this term, but this term two-spirit in itself is recognizing that there is numerous tribal cultures and languages because every single one of those 580 tribes just in the United States have their own language. Each and every one of us, uh, we have tribal languages that is our oral history. So we were here before first contact. We were here before 1492. We were very much immersed in our cultures and in, in the Teospais, which is like the communities that we were born into. Um, it wasn't until an act of Congress, you know, very much so um, trying to steal the land by stealing the children, which is a war tactic, divide and conquer the people, um, <clears throat> where we were forced to go to boarding schools in, in attempts to assimilate us from our savagery. <laughs> um, you know, because it's in the Constitution. It does say, you know, um, you know, I'm. I also often like to say, you know, I'm. I'm that savage Indian in the Constitution that they warned you about, because I will use my constitutional rights, my voice, and and my cultural protocols to stand strong. And that's why I go by the the term Two Spirit Warrior Queen. Your privilege was built on the shoulders of my ancestors, built by stolen people built on a land where there's no borders. Um, for me, that's it in a nutshell by saying, you know, we're still living in historical trauma, passed down unconsensually at a DNA molecular level where we're living and breathing this intergenerational trauma. The history of Democratic Republic of Congo, formerly known as Congo Free State, um, and Belgian Congo, which has uh, deeply intertwined with oppression, exploitation, uh, and violence stemming from colonialism, capitalism, and ongoing power, ongoing power struggle. I think about going back to the late 19 and early 20th centuries under the Belgian uh, King Leopold II's brutal regime. Um, and it was under this guise of humanitarianism and civilizing mission, uh, Leopold's administration uh, plundered the Congo for its abundant natural resources, particularly rubber and ivory. 
the Congolese people were subjected and forced to labor, extreme violence, and leading to death of millions, as you highlighted. And mm. the legacy of colonization, uh, particularly of the resources extraction and exploitation, didn't just end with the Belgian rule. It, it you know, post independence, multiple multinational corruptions, often with Western interests, continue to exploit the DRC's vast mineral wealth, which includes coltan, cobalt, and copper. Uh, you know, the profit-driven extraction of these resources has perpetuated cycles of conflict, corruption, and poverty, enriching a select few while leaving the majority of Congolese people impoverished and marginalized. In the society shaped by colonization legacy and capitalist, capitalist exploitation, Black, queer, and trans individuals often face compounded discrimination and violence. They're, they experience intersecting form of oppression based off their race, their gender identity, sexual orientation. Highlighting, for example, some cases where the trans folks there who are working hard to change some of the rights have been prevented to vote. And we see that parallel in the global north. We see that that same thing happening now in Ghana. We see that happening last year in Uganda. We see it happening also in Nigeria. What I am clear about is the pendulum swing that is happening within the global north and how the white supremacist faith leaders that are pushing these rhetoric and funding these bills internationally to support these anti-queer and anti-trans law that often impact at the intersection of folks who hold marginal intersecting identity. A lot of the folks who are experiencing the displacement uh, as Congolese people, when we're talking about Congo, who are being displaced end up in refugee camps. And within those refugee camps, they are still experiencing rape, they're experiencing harm, they're experiencing violence, they're experiencing lack of medical resources. We can't even discuss reproductive justice rights when they're not even getting access to medical. Like, yes, we need to discuss it, but they are not even discussing those issues because they are literally wanting food and water. A lot of trans women are also fleeing their areas in DRC, leaving the eastern part and going to another part, particularly a shelter that is um, in uh, Bakivu, trying to get housing. And on their way to getting housing, they are beaten, they are attacked, they are raped. We have a queer person, particularly a Black identified lesbian, who were housing trans women who then ended up committing suicide because she was targeted at the amount rate by folks, faith leaders, because she was housing trans folks. And my urgent request of faith leaders that are here who are queer and trans is that we get to interrupt it. The issues that many of them are faced, particularly black trans masculine folks, is that they're experiencing conversion rate. That's the language that is used, right? We see masculine center women experiencing conversion rape. I identify as a Vakasana Lewa to my people uh, of Fiji as an indigenous Itoke and Pacific, Pacific Island LGBTQI families have long included uh, Mahus, Vakasana Lewa, Palopa, this term, which is called MVVFAF, plus was coined by Phoenicia Brown Acton, and we currently use this term within the Red Book community or within the LGBT community in the Pacific region. And it also symbolizes the diverse identities within the Pacific culture. And I also wanted to acknowledge what Nala said, you know, the constant blame on LGBTQI people, uh, you know, particularly in the Pacific region. LGBTQI people are constantly blamed for the cause of climate change and disaster. And just recently, there's a cyclone that's currently hitting Fiji as we speak. And then again, 
circling around social media and the use of the platform is trans people particularly, I believe, for the cause of climate change and the cause of floods and disasters in Fiji. And this really brings in a lot of the the forms of discrimination and the continued stigma against LGBTQI people, particularly transgender people. You know, Fiji has a, a, a very complex history of colonialism with both the US and, the, and, and Britain, who had played a significant role while the US didn't really have a direct occupation to Fiji. It did establish a military presence on, on some of the islands during World War II which had lasting impact. And, and even, you know, the British colonization, on the other hand, lasted from between the 19th century until Fiji gained independence in 1970. So the legacy of the British colonial rule continues to influence Fiji's political, Fiji's social and economic lands landscape. And in terms of the, you know, the intersections between Black and trans people in Fiji, it's very essential to recognize the, you know, the, the diversity of experiences within our community. And, you know, discrimination and marginalization based on race, gender identity, and even sexual orientation still persist with intersecting forms of oppression and really shaping lived experiences. So the impact of Western colonialization, whether British or American, have you know, contributed to systemic inequalities and injustices that disproportionately affect marginalized groups. This impact also you know, has been seen in various aspects within the Fijian community and including land, uh, ownership, uh, access to resources, even the the, the political uh, representation and cultural practices. Nakapia Mahu were known as healers and custodians of uh, of of our culture and would tell our narratives. But because of colonialization, that has you know disrupted our forms of identity, our forms of autonomy, uh, you know, over our indigenous identity, this has, you know, really shift a lot of the narrative. And just to say furthermore, you know, the, the legacy of, of colonialism has really perpetuated a lot of the Eurocentric norms and, you know, the standards which can and continue to to really marginalize non-Western identities and the expression, including who, those of Black and trans people in Fiji. Uh, 1948 was the beginning of colonization for Palestine. That was when over 750,000 Palestinians were forced out of their homes. Similar to what we're seeing today in Gaza, uh, we refer to this event as the Nakba. That translates into the catastrophe. Since 1948, there's been what uh, we call the ongoing Nakba. So Palestinians have lived over seven decades under Israel's violent military rule. Uh, the way that they colonized us was fragmentation. So we have Gaza, we have the West Bank, and we have the uh, Palestine, historic Palestine, which what the colonizers refer to as Israel. So Palestinians, of course, we refer to all of the land as Palestine, but these are the enclaves that the colonizer has determined for us uh, through force, through violent force. Um, for Palestinians who live under military occupation, daily life is an obstacle course for survival, figuratively and literally. It is a very common experience to have family members arrested, family members or community members shot and executed on a weekly to now daily basis since October 7th. Of course, uh, these attacks have heightened. Uh, there are apartheid policies that segregate Palestinians from Israeli Jews. Uh, it's based both off of religion and uh, quote unquote nationality of being Israeli, which of course uh, you're qualified to do that. So long as you're Jewish, there's really no other requirement there. And uh, the primary, most obvious example of, uh, besides the explicit laws, the explicit apartheid laws, is the segregation wall. So we know that as the apartheid wall, and that is used to separate Palestinians from one another. It is used to uh, push this rhetoric that Palestinians are a security threat, and therefore they have to be separated from Israeli Jews. 
And uh, this is also used as a tactic to steal more Palestinian land, to build settlements with state violence and state-backed settler violence. So, so again, so long as you're an Israeli Jew, you can actually just walk around with a gun, a really big one. I'm sure many of you have seen pictures. You can just walk around, and if you're a Palestinian who's living in any of those 48 territories, that's just something you deal with every day, knowing that these people can just shoot you and they'll be fine, um, and, and you really you don't have a say in the matter. So since the colonization in 1948, um, and even before that, there's been, a Palestinian, there's been a history of Palestinian resistance, Palestinians fighting back. That's what we do. Uh, you know, we don't stand down. We, we fight for our land. That's just what we do. We fight for our land. We fight for our people. This is our history. Uh, Gaza happens to be one of the biggest sources of resistance. Uh, so they're actually attacked the most because they fight for their rights the hardest. This is why we see such heavy aggressions on Gaza. Uh, so quick history of Gaza. Israel had settlements in Gaza disengaged in 2006. In 2007, Israel decided that the besieged Gaza uh, would be a concentration camp. Uh, so for 16 years, Palestinians in Gaza have been living under siege and blockade in one of the most densely populated areas where over 2 million Palestinians, 78% of whom are refugees from 1948, that's where they reside. So even before October 7th, every, Palest every aspect of Palestinian life in Gaza was controlled by drones, naval ship, and surveillance, among many other things. Uh, they live in the dystopian reality that you read about in sci-fi novels, such as 1984. Uh, as a result, resistance has been inevitable, right? Because you can't trap people in the world's largest concentration camp for that long without ongoing bombardment campaigns, uh, or sorry, during ongoing ca uh, bombardment campaigns without expecting people to protect and defend their people and their land from genocidal colonization. It's just even logically speaking, this is this is the only likely outcome. So some examples of the conditions of Gaza siege before October 7th, uh, food was allowed in by Israel based on calorie counts. So saying each person can have 2,000 calories a day. That's how they were allowing food in. Over 95% of Gaza's water was undrinkable before October 7th. Uh, so that's largely due to the bombing campaigns, which destabilized the water treatment plants. And then, of course, as a result of the siege, limited materials are allowed in to even rebuild. So a lot of the rebuilding that's happened in Gaza throughout the years uh, were actually uh, a lot of those materials were from old rubble, right? So Palestinians, uh, there's a lot about Palestinian innovation, you know, um, and and what uh, Palestinians and Gaza have done to even rebuild rebuild their own land with that added restriction of of materials not being allowed in things as simple as pasta or um, you know children's formula, like these things are are restricted entry even before October seventh. Another thing is the hospital systems. Uh, were not sufficient enough to treat people with cancer. So Palestinians with cancer had to apply in advance to go to Jerusalem to get their treatment. And actually today, right now, some of those cancer patients are actually being sent back to Gaza. But Palestinians have a long history uh, of a variety of resistance tactics. So yes, there's armed resistance, but there have been many other resistance attempts since 1948 and even before that. Uh, for instance, in 2018, there was the Great Return March. So that was a mass nonviolent protest uh, in Gaza where hundreds of thousands of Palestinians of all ages and genders uh, took to the fence that separated them from the rest of Palestinian land. As a result of this nonviolent action, no arms were used. Uh, more than 200 Palestinians were killed and 36,000 Palestinians were injured. Um, and pre-October 7th, sporadically, there have been five bombing campaigns uh, over the course of 14 years. Same nature of attacks that we're seeing today, but what we're seeing today, this is the first time we've seen anything at this scale. This is larger than the 1948 Nakba of Palestinians displaced and killed. We're already talking about 2 million Palestinians displaced. We're talking about, I didn't, I, admittedly, I, 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 even I sometimes having, uh, I'm having a hard time keeping up tens of thousands, I believe we're at 40,000 people killed. So that's even topping the death toll from the 1948 Nakba. And of course, we know that there are accounts of all kinds of violence, not just killing, um, but, you know, purposeful, um, it's a mass disabling event, uh, sexual violence, state sanctioned sexual violence, all, all these things. It's, it's no different whether you're trans or cis, uh, you're going to be mistreated the same, you're going to be disrespected the same. There is no rainbow door uh, for queers at the checkpoint. They look at us all the same. So the existence of Israel is not safe for any Palestinian, and especially not queer and trans Palestinians. Um, in terms of safety, if you look at Gaza, for instance, now, queer and trans people are living underneath the bombs. They're part of the numbers that are coming out. Um, today, one of the most, uh, this happened, I believe, a few weeks ago, one of the most prominent queer feminist activists is in an Israeli jail cell right now. 
His name is Amr Khatib. He's from Ramallah on the West Bank. So when you're asking yourself about the violence that queer and trans Palestinians face, it's very much like what our community family members who aren't queer and trans, uh, what they're facing. Of course, there's a layer of not being able to express yourself while living under oppression, but there isn't a safe world. There isn't a safe place in the world for any of us, really. Uh, we exist as queer and trans in every realm. The ultimate, ultimate violence we face is by Israel, by settler violence. As visibly queer and trans people, we have targets on our back. And as Palestinians, we have targets on our backs. The question is about how we can see past the differences that those in power want us to zoom in on, move past that in order to solidify the solidarity. So we realize that our freedom is bound with one another. The way we get the targets off our backs is to have each other's backs. So uh, also, uh, encourage folks to write letters, you know, in your organization, get your team members, get your staff, get everyone that you know to write letters of response. If you go to Rhodes website, there is a blog section under our programs where you will get updates on what's going on. Go ahead and read those blogs. Check out the blog. We also give you instruction on ways and, and how you can support. Those blogs are not just written by me. They're actually written from folks who are residing and living, they have taken the lead to really uh, blog about some of the things that are happening. So please, please, please go to Rhodes' website, go on the program you see blog, uh, No Siblings Left Behind initiative. And it, it is our goal to constantly bring what is happening. We try to stay away from sharing photos, but just know that, you know, there are folks who are like, I need proof. I, how do I know this is happening? We can schedule a, a town hall Zoom meeting and I can get folks to share stories and, and give you all the visuals that you need, but it should not be necessary. Just want to highlight that. Um, funding, funding. I know siblings who are listening. We are at capacity financially. We are at capacity when it comes to our own safety. And you will not imagine how much a dollar goes, even if it is a dollar. That dollar is abundant for food. That bought that. That dollar is abundant for water. That dollar is abundant for medication. Um, emergency bail fund, that dollar goes a long way. In terms of donation outside of monetary, we do have trips coming up. So if you would like to donate your clothes that are, you know, new and not used, uh, please do that. If there are folks who you bought a binder, you never wore the binder, give it to us. If there are stand to pee items, give it to us. If you know sanny, um, sanny pads and stuff like that, please send it to us, you know, arrange, reach out to us, and we would schedule a way to get those items. So when our travels are coming up, we have items. Normally when we have, under our Emerging Leaders Program, when a leader is uh, selected to come internationally, one of their suitcases that they're traveling must be a suitcase full of donations. That also can be books that are banned. I wanna be clear on the extent of what folks do not have access to. If it is books that are banned, that you know that you have access to, please purchase them. It really helps trans folks see themselves. I would really like to ask each of you to start including the word two-spirit when you say LGBTQ, AI+, or whatever the rainbow acronym you use, because it's an erasure when you're leaving out the word two-spirit. Because every time I'm in a group or I'm doing work, with my own community and I hear folks leaving out two spirit, it makes me feel erased. It makes me feel like, okay, so in this work that I'm doing, we're not acknowledging this work's being done on stolen land by stolen people that's, you know, stealing our continuous liberation. So my call to action is every time you use the word two spirit in your work, regardless on what land you're on, it's saving lives. So we'll be organizing uh, a climate summit in April, and this is really inviting everyone to really talk about the intersectionality, whether through climate, gender, um, genocide, and even, you know, land grabbing and all that's happening around the world. And I just want to say that also a call to action is really the use of our social media platforms and the way that we use it to make sure that we are amplifying voices of marginalized, within marginalizing, marginalized groups within the way that we work. 
you know, the, there's there's GoFundMe's going around, all these things. So of course, like if folks want to contribute wherever they like, I think that I, again, I, I think like I just want to echo what uh, Nala was saying about how um, you know every dollar counts. So I, I don't think there's necessarily a wrong place as long as you know that it's verified. That's all that matters. But I think in terms of organizations, I would recommend Safebo and and, uh, and Mesjid. The acronym is M A S G D. So Safebo is a the queer and trans organiz uh, led organization, queer trans um, organization that is, uh, uh, is is providing collecting aid and delivering uh, money, like actual money directly to those who have just been displaced uh, from Gaza in e Egypt. So the conditions there are really bad. I mean, like it's, it's crazy because like once people leave, um, like some of the things I was hearing is like, if you're a child, Obviously, the people were allowed to leave. It's it's a very short list. It's it's people who are extremely vulnerable. But like, let's say you're a child and you're amputated, uh, you're basically uh, chained to a hospital bed. You can't leave that hospital bed. So some of the work they do is actually just visiting these children, giving them a little Game Boy or something, just like um, that kind of direct aid. And then of course, going into uh, delivering food, supplies, uh, money, that sort of thing. And then Mesjid M A S G D is a uh, um, LGBTQ plus uh, two spirit uh, organization, uh, a Muslim organization that uh, that money also goes directly to Gaza, but it also goes towards mutual aid for folks here who are heavily impacted, not just Palestinians, but anybody uh, who's Muslim who is impacted by any of the genocides, any of the horrors that are happening around the world. So it's both both mutual aid to help folks here and to help folks abroad. There's in terms of voting, AJP encourages you to exercise your civic right and go vote in the upcoming presidential primaries on April 2nd. We understand that many feel discouraged of the genocide in Gaza. Uh, and basically we want to let folks know that there's an option to leave your ballot blank, similar to the uncommitted campaign in Michigan last month. To learn more about this option, you can go to the campaign's website, leaveitblankny.com. AJP and so if there is a mental health provider that is present, I ask of you, and you have the capacity, you have your system of support set up after holding, I ask you to offer your time. We have so many rape survivors who just need someone to hear that what they're experiencing is valid. If there's Reiki practitioners that are available, I ask of you, come, I invite you to give yourself. If there are faith leaders that are watching this, I call upon you in your voice and your ministry. And whatever that may look like, I call you to your leadership to interrupt the rhetoric, to interrupt these policies, to interrupt other faith leaders and to remind folks that they are loved by God. That what is happening in the face of genocide and ethnic cleansing is not okay. Call a thing a thing to show up when it's time for hearings and testimony, to speak against these bills that are happening in the global North that are impacting our community in the global South. You are needed at a time like this. Our